Celebrating 46 years on the air, Award-Winning Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, the economy may be stretched thin, but farmland values stay strong, at least for now. In Southern Gardening, Eddie says it may be chilly, but you can still go tropical. In the markets, record cattle prices in the news, and some say it could be more of a permanent thing. And in our feature, the inside story on a not-so-obvious supply chain solution. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Zach Ashmore. And I'm Mike Russell. Good to have you with us again here on Farm Week. Just days ago, the Fed chair said a March rate cut is unlikely. The higher borrowing rate was thought to be a damper on farmland sales. But cash stayed king, which led to a flurry of sales. Peter Tubbs has the story. Resiliency summarized the sale of farmland over the last six months of 2023, according to Farmers National Company. The input costs have, have settled somewhat, but they're still, still pretty pricey. And so even with all those factors, we're still seeing uh, land values maintain the levels that they've increased over the past three years. Shadig, the company's senior VP of real estate operations, says the late rally came after a summer slowdown in land sales. We got into the end of August, early September, and it's like they kicked it in high gear. And we had a, one of the strongest, well, maybe the strongest September we've ever seen as a company. That allowed a lot of these operators to get into harvest, understand that they had better yields than they anticipated. Traditionally, higher interest rates slow the sale of farmland and other big ticket items. We're finding out how much cash people have in their pockets, and it's more than we thought. However, I'm going to say that going into 2024, where we're already seeing an increase in lending, and along with that, those higher interest rates. So operators are gonna have some additional expense to pay in the, in the form of interest rates on a land loan. And, and then just the fact that they're, they're going in and they're, there's a higher volume of requests for loans. Shadig adds the increase in demand for lending could change the way a sale ends. I think that we're gonna, we're gonna start to see more no sales because of that and that. And the no sales are, are a combination of you know, they're, we're a little bit too ambitious on what we think that land's gonna bring today. It's still bringing record values than what we've seen in the past 25 years. Commodity markets, like always, are the key driver in keeping land values at a higher level. There are still simply more motivated buyers than there are willing sellers. It's just, just as simple as that. And that's where that competition is created and will be continued to be created. Farmland value, of course, one of the major indicators of overall ag strength. Needless to say, it's reflected in the volume and prices of the commodities that drive ag strength. More on that in a moment. In Europe, farmers unhappy with their lawmakers' attempts to cut fuel subsidies and forcing some fields to lie fallow instead of producing a profit. This ongoing for some time, but it would seem their protests are bearing fruit. David Miller reports. European Union farmers took to their tractors again this week, keeping the pressure up in their weeks-long series of protests. At issue are cuts to agricultural fuel subsidies, higher environmental taxes, and increased imports of lower-cost commodities. <laughs> Members of several European farm groups say there is a lack of support for their plight from the European Union Commission in Brussels. In response, the EC announced plans to shield farmers from cheaper imports due to the nearly two-year-old Ukrainian war and will allow farmers to use land forced to lie fallow for environmental reasons. In France, earlier in the week, where protesting has been more disruptive, government officials showered farmers with promises of help, including emergency aid and controls on imported food. More now on ag strength. Every year, Mississippi State University Extension hosts an Ag Outlook Conference for ag lenders. But this year, uncertainty from a number of angles in the state and national economies led MSU to open the conference up to 
a broader audience. In terms of farm economy, um, I think there's a great, great uncertainty. Um, so 2022 was a great year, and 2023 we saw, we sort of saw a decline in farm income, and such trend is expected to continue for 2024. And also adding to that, we had droughts, high inflation, and high interest rates. And with those words, the organizer of Mississippi State's Ag Outlook Forum, Kevin Kim, underscored how virtually all the stakeholders in Mississippi's and the nation's ag economy are feeling. Keynote speaker Nathan Kaufman from the Federal Reserve, cautiously optimistic, told his audience that if government payouts weren't part of the picture over the last few years... You would have seen delinquency rates continuing to rise continuing to see financial pressure, and that's not what we've seen. Not only have we not seen the increase in delinquencies, we actually have a new record low of delinquency rates on farm loans. So all of this is going to be consistent with what I was describing earlier of the strength in ag over the past three years, and it's extremely important in terms of what's going to drive the outlook for agriculture over the next year or two. Even though we likely will see thinner profit margins and we will see incomes declining, it's not going to generate real significant financial stress because we're coming off of one of the lowest periods of financial stress in agriculture that we've had really in history. A number of experts were on hand for the Ag Outlook Forum, including those on the finance side, who play a critical role in helping producers manage economic risk. Southern Ag Credit's Elliot Fancher gives a nod to Mississippi State Extension and its network of county agents. FSA uses Mississippi State's price projections, so usually when our board meets, they like to lean on what FSA's want to go with, so if you translate that back, it's coming from Mississippi State Extension. So that's why I keep in touch with a, with a lot of these agents throughout the year, lean on them with some questions. They're able to send me some information. It just it helps. It helps out a lot. Much insight coming out of that conference. Nathan Kaufman highlighted the impact of labor markets, consumer spending, and interest rates on ag strength. He did say that conditions have tightened since last year and said the strength of the global economy will be a factor in 2024. On the lighter side, the loquat, actually native to Asia, but now commonly grown here in the U.S. as an ornamental tree, has a special property for this time of the year. It fruits in the winter. Here's Eddie with more on what makes it such a great addition to any garden or landscape. Today, Southern Gardening is in Loosedale, Mississippi, admiring this beautiful loquat tree that's producing fruit in the middle of winter. The loquat tree, also known as Japanese plum, is a small to medium-sized evergreen tree that is native to China, but now is widely grown in many countries around the world. The tree is prized for its attractive foliage, fragrant flowers, and delicious fruit. One of the most striking features of the loquat tree is its dense and rounded canopy of glossy, dark green leaves. The leaves are simple, alternate, and lancelot in shape, with a length of 4 to 10 inches and a width of 2 to 4 inches. The leaves are leathery and have a prominent vein that runs parallel to each other. They provide excellent shade and are highly ornamental, making the loquat tree an ideal choice for landscaping. In the late fall and early winter, the tree produces clusters of small, fragrant white flowers. The flowers are highly fragrant and can be smelled from a distance. The fragrance attracts bees and other pollinators to the tree, which helps to ensure that the flowers are adequately pollinated and that the tree will produce a good crop of fruit. The small, rounded, or oval-shaped fruit that measures about one to two inches in diameter has a thin, fuzzy skin that ranges from yellow to orange in color. The fruit can be eaten fresh or used to make jams, jellies, and other desserts. Loquats can be grown from zone seven to 10 but obviously, because the fruit has to go through the winter, 
you're more likely to get a crop in central and southern Mississippi. I'm Eddie Smith and I will see you next time on Southern Gardening. We'll take a short break, but stick around. Coming up on our Farm Week feature, an extended version of a story we brought you not long ago. The supply chain challenges of recent years actually sparked some creative responses, resulting in new ways for goods to get from one place to another. Shipping from the coasts has always been popular, but the Great Lakes region has turned into a new favorite. We'll visit Cleveland and Duluth, where smart operators make for savvy shipping. First rate freight coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith, and their right to make their own plans and arrive at their own decisions, and their ability and power to enlarge their lives and plan for the happiness of those they love. I believe that education, of which extension work is an essential part, is basic in stimulating individual initiative, self-determination, and leadership that these are the keys to democracy and that people when given facts they understand will act not only in their self-interest but also in the interest of society. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations, and their faith. I believe in intellectual freedom to search for and present the truth without bias and with courteous tolerance toward the views of others. I believe that education is a lifelong process and the greatest university is the home. That my success as a teacher is proportional to those qualities of mind and spirit that give me welcome entrance to the homes of the families I serve. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. Time for the market report. A few surprises last week at the close. That's right, Mike. Some commodities making big moves. We'll talk about it, but first, the numbers. What were last week's biggest gains and losses? And then in our row report, we look at what's moving row crops. And finally, a dive into current cattle prices. Why are they so high? So, market split last week. Row crops down with one exception while livestock on the way up. Let's take a look. Last week's biggest gain, cotton up about two and three quarters cents, a three and a quarter percent rise from the previous week. Last week's biggest loss, soybean oil, down 20 and three quarters cents, and over four and a half percent drop from the previous week. So what's the cause of row crops falling? According to Chris Robinson, it has to do with traders coming to terms with grains, especially corn and wheat at the lowest prices in quite a while. You know, we have to start somewhere. We're at three-year lows. Uh, that's the problem with corn and wheat. We're at three-year lows, and everybody for the last year has been like, okay, is the low end, is the low end, is the low end, and uh, it's just been very, very difficult. And um, so, yeah, I think if there is a rally, it could come from something in Europe. We're talking about corn, you gotta talk about old crop or new crop. So old crop is March. That's what's out there, and that's under a lot of pressure. Um, this, this level, this, this 450 level, 440 level is very, very big. Go all the way back to 2013 to 2017. That was the top. Well, we remember that was considered a really good price, 430. So we're kind of dancing with that level now. I think if that was to fail, if the 430, 430 support fails, then you'll see kind of a natural as the market tries to find support. So I, I would anticipate that if, if that doesn't hold, we go to 420, 425. Um, you know, as far as making the big call, <clears throat> the same people that, you know, last summer when we were at six, six dollar corn said we were going to eight. Uh, I'd be, I'm worried of that just because we're at 440 doesn't mean we're destined to go to 350. It's a possibility. It's always a possibility. But we're, we're having, we're putting up a very good fight at this 440 level. We had, we had a 25, 30 cent, a nice rally in, in soybeans. And again, what happened? There were no legs. 
So I think that in the, in the soybean market, which is still relatively in good shape, if you look at new crop soybeans, which is what I'm kind of looking ahead to, you know, we, we're right there fighting at that $12 level. A month and a half ago, we were 13 bucks. People were like, okay, here we go. I would say this, and, and the last time I was on um, around Thanksgiving, I said, try and defend $12 beans, try and defend $5 corn. And I think that uh, that's the level I think a lot of people are gonna be looking at. If we get corn back up north of five bucks, do something. If we get beans north of $12, try and do something. Uh, there's some good fundamentals driving cotton. We've had a really nice recovery. Uh, 90 cents is going to be a big target for next year's cotton, but uh, I think we're at three or four month highs in cotton right now. It's a, it's a great recovery rally, and it is. It's the one silver lining. And you know, I was talking to some guys in the Delta today that, you know, are they going to plant cotton or, or beans? Most of them are probably going to end up planting beans just because of the, the economics, because even today at, at $12 or, you know, 11.80 beans, wherever we're at, that's still profitable for most guys. But cotton is a, is a, is a great story if you're looking for a bull story. In the cattle markets, prices still high coming into the new year, and for the same reasons as the last. Here's a recap of what's going on, bolstered by a recent USDA cattle report. According to the USDA, all cattle and calves on feed are down 2% from January last year. And the final report from calf inventory of 2023 shows that calves are also down 2% from 2022. Subsequently, in the same report, cattle and calves on feed for the U.S. slaughter market are up 2% compared to January last year. So what does that mean for current cattle prices? Just a recap on why herds are low in the first place. This is an issue we've covered for the past several years, and it has to do with ongoing drought in the Midwest that's also affected the Southeast. According to Cattle Facts, in a recent report, it looks like cattle prices this year may continue to be high, potentially for the next several years as the herds rebuild. They project that fed steers will be up $9, feeder steers up $20, steer calves up $28, and utility cows up $16 all in comparison to last year. So what do the analysts have to say about it? According to Chris Robinson, the rally we're seeing has more to do with feeder cattle than live cattle. I wanted to talk about that today. The deferred months for, for not only live cattle, but even feeder cattle, they're just gone vertical. So I'm talking about June, July, August. We kind of have two markets. So if you're a producer out there, um, we've had a tremendous recovery in the, the spot months after we had that debacle, the October to Dees, you know, that was just a horrendous sell-off. We've clawed back a huge percentage of that, 50 to 60 percent of that. But I think the big story is deferred. That's a great opportunity for producers. You know, uh, expensive prices out there. It's just like when we were at, you know, 650 corn. Maybe it doesn't last forever. It's a good opportunity for producers. The, the feeder cattle, especially this rally, post the report was really fueled by more feeder cattle than live cattle. That's, and then again, that has to do with the, the uh, economics of the size of the herd that's coming out there. That's, you know, it takes time to rebuild the herd. Now, here's the other problem with this. Usually when it hits the headlines, sometimes the headlines put the highs in, right? You know, when we were back here in, in uh, around Thanksgiving, we had the hot and dry in, in South America, Brazil. That was almost the top, of, and then we had the $2 break in soybeans. So take advantage of when these markets have these nice rallies. Take advantage of it. And that's it for a deeper look into the markets. Mike. Thanks, Zach. So you've heard of making lemonade from lemons, right? The supply chain challenges that came with the pandemic prompted shippers and shipping companies to put on their thinking caps and look for better ways to move goods out of the Midwest. Turns out the Great Lakes region was the answer. Laura Weber Davis has more. Since 2020, backups at ports in the Atlantic and Pacific coasts have left cargo ships stacked up, waiting to unload in the U.S. And rising fuel costs, congested highways, and a shortage of truck drivers are also creating headaches for businesses wanting to get their goods in or out of the U.S. interior. And they're looking for other options. Will Friedman is president and CEO of the Port of Cleveland. The companies that need to move these goods, either as a manufacturer or as a retailer, um, they're pretty desperate. And so, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. And they're now asking much more so than previously, why can't we get a ship into Cleveland and just avoid all that gridlock at, at those big ports? But rerouting cargo from congested coastal ports to Cleveland isn't so simple. 
On the Great Lakes, freighters mainly move bulk cargoes like iron ore, grain, and coal that are loaded loose into the ship's holds. But globally, most cargo is moved in containers. Great Lakes freighters and the ports they visit aren't really set up to handle large shipments in containers, but that may be changing. In 2014, the Port of Cleveland saw an opportunity and developed the first container service on the Great Lakes to handle import and export cargo. In partnership with Dutch company Spleethof, they created the Cleveland Europe Express with a regularly scheduled route between Cleveland and Antwerp. The Peyton Lynn Sea, a small container ship, travels out of the St. Lawrence Seaway and across the Atlantic. The trip takes approximately 14 days, with a few days in each port to unload. And the opportunity to move other types of cargo on the Great Lakes in containers is providing new cost-effective transportation solutions for some shippers. It actually does help with cost for a ship to come all the way into Cleveland because the longer you keep cargo on the water, the more economical it is. The majority of the cost to move, let's say a flat screen TV from China to Chicago or Columbus, Ohio, is the inland transportation, the over the land transportation. Once it's on a ship, even if it's a smaller ship, doesn't have to be a mega ship, doesn't cost that much because you have those, you know, economies of scale. You, you're just pushing that ship through the water. You're not burning as much fuel. It's also more sustainable. It's also a greener form of transportation. And according to Friedman, shipping through Cleveland avoids the delays that can happen at congested ocean ports. Unlike the big ports where your container may be on a ship and it sits at anchor, you know, waiting to get to a berth for 30 days or 15 days, uh, our service is more reliable. In Cleveland, the cargo and containers has been mostly industrial, non-consumer goods, and exports from northern Ohio and bordering states. But on more than one occasion, they have been the answer for a business outside their region. We just had some rubber, synthetic rubber, um, moving up from Houston, uh, getting trucked all the way up here uh, to get loaded onto the Peyton and go to Europe. Um, so. Uh, those are the kinds of, you know, somewhat uh, counterintuitive uh, moves we're seeing here with all these supply chain problems. They could not get a ship or find space on a ship out of Port of Houston, so they moved that rubber all the way up here. And Cleveland isn't the only Great Lakes port that's looking to expand its container shipping. The port of Duluth Superior is the largest port on the Great Lakes by tonnage, including the twin ports of Duluth, Minnesota and Superior, Wisconsin. And it's making waves in container shipping. Deb DeLuca is the executive director of the Duluth Seaway Port Authority. From here, you can reach major markets such as the Twin Cities, Fargo, Des Moines, also Milwaukee, and even down to Chicago. So um, it, it, from, a, from a logistics standpoint, that's very attractive. Last fall, the port of Duluth was granted approval by U.S. Customs and Border Protection to handle shipping containers by water. And just recently, it exported its first shipment, 200 containers of kidney beans from a company in the region. They were having difficulties um, arriving at a supply chain solution with all the snarls and backups and supply chains over the past couple of years. They were not able to get their goods to market. So um, they, working with a freight forwarder, a trucking company, they were looking for an alternative solution and that ended up being sending those containers by ship through our terminal. Great Lakes ports are also looking into new options like a feeder service where containers are offloaded in bigger ports and transported along the St. Lawrence Seaway in smaller vessels, similar to what is done in Europe. Along with all the opportunities, there are many challenges to container shipping on the Great Lakes, including the locks of the St. Lawrence Seaway, which restrict the size of the ship. If you're coming into the Great Lakes from outside the system, you're limited by the dimensions of the locks. There are 15 locks that get you from sea level up to where we are, which is roughly 650 feet above sea level. And those lock dimensions are roughly 
750 feet long and about 75 feet wide. Uh, and the controlling depth of the water in all the channels on the Great Lakes is about 27 feet, 27 or 28 feet. So ships can't exceed those dimensions. Another factor that has been challenging for container shipping is the shortened season. Both the St. Lawrence Seaway and the Sioux Locks close during the winter. Many who use the system or ports on the system are at, like me, advocate for let's keep the system open longer. Um, we think that's feasible from a technology point of view. We, we all know, unfortunately, with climate change that we're not getting as much ice cover anymore. Winters aren't as severe. Let's allow more year-round shipping or closer to year-round shipping. Both the ports of Cleveland and Duluth expect to move more shipping containers in the coming year. Never underestimate the power of ingenuity. Well, next week, ahead of this year's Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions, one more look at last year's event. It's one of the most popular stories we do every year, the grand finale for young people in 4-H and FFA competing to become champions in this beloved event. Come with us again to Jackson, where you'll meet two competitors who epitomize the discipline and drive of Mississippi's hardworking youth. The 2023 Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions. That's next time on Farm Week. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and YouTube. See you next week. Thanks for watching.